So today we will have Son Roshi commemoration Taisho and interweaving the second of the ten ox herding pictures. The preface. With the aid of the sutras, you gain understanding. Through study of the teachings, you find traces. You see clearly that the many vessels are all one metal, and the 10,000 things are all yourself. But if you do not discern correct from incorrect, how will you recognize true from false? Since you have yet to pass through that gate, only tentatively have you seen the traces. The verse. By the water and under the trees, tracks in swift profusion. In the sweet grasses, thick with growth, did you see it or not? Even in the depths of the deepest mountains, how could it hide from others its snout turned toward the sky? Good afternoon. It's so good to be able to address you from my actual Taisho seat in the Zendo. Yeah, things don't work too well, but we're used to that. We've had a year of it. It's Saturday afternoon live at Hoenji. And this morning's Doksan and tomorrow's were and will be in the actual Doksan room. Now that more of us are fully vaccinated and or quarantined, we're carefully examining our protocols anew and our in-person possibilities for our temples. At this time, I may hear a cheer. And even those who are on Zoom, yes, you can cheer. All right, good. Although we open this March on session Friday evening, last night, the real beginning was the day before. March 11th. On March 11th, 1984, 37 years ago, this past Thursday, Nakagawa Soen Roshi dropped his body. Yet, his endless dimension, universal life continues to inspire our practice and invigorate the Daibosatsu Mandala. 
coming from the depths of his own experience. His voice resounds. March on. March on bravely. March on. Through pain, grief, confusion, mistakes, despair, continue and continue on this endless path. On March 11th, 2011, 10 years ago, this past Thursday, in the Tohoku region of Honshu, Japan's main island, nearly 20,000 humans and countless other beings perished in a great disaster. The strongest earthquake in Japan's recorded history, followed by tsunami <coughs> with waves more than 130 feet high and explosions and meltdowns of three reactors at the Fukushima nuclear plant. On March 11th, 2020, the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus a pandemic. A global disaster. And lockdowns began. It has claimed more than 2.6 million lives so far. We have responded with home based intensive practice, our COVID session without end, offering chanting for the deceased, Kanzeo for all those who are suffering and supporting each other through our online meetings and we continue to look deeply into why we are here what we are doing with our precious human lives Last month, on Pari Nirvana Day at our winter session, I began speaking on the 10 Oxfording pictures for this year of the metal ox. Drawings, poetry created by Kakuon Shion Zenji who lived in China in the 12th century. And his Dharma heir, Jion Osho, wrote a preface to each picture and verse. So I'll continue today with the second picture through the lens of Soenoshi's life. He was born into a samurai family on March 
1907, in Kilung, Formosa, now Taiwan. And given the name Motoi, his father, an army doctor, died when Motoi was quite young, and his mother struggled to raise three sons. He was the oldest. From an early age, he was clearly brilliant. He loved the arts, literature, music, tea ceremony, no theater, painting. And throughout his life, he surrounded himself with visionary artists, several of whom he brought to Daibosatsu Zendo. In junior high school, he and his friends chipped in to buy a recording of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which had just been introduced into Japan. Hearing it, he was so moved, he told us he couldn't stop shivering for three days. He listened to it all his life, and he brought it back to the West years later to play at the end of session, a tradition we've continued every Rohatsu. Moltoi was quite a student, but he wasn't content with intellectual accomplishments. He had already begun seeking the ox. And what is the ox? True nature, true self. In endless vow, he said, I was in my freshman year at First Academy and was in agony, looking for something to which I could dedicate my life. I thought whatever I would do would be wasteful and meaningless until I found an essential plan for my life. In my search for something absolute, the accumulated things of ordinary life seemed to be stupidly squirming about. They faded away one after another. Exhausted by a feeling of vacancy, I wept with sadness on the second floor of the dormitory. One day, in the corner of the dark library, I accidentally opened a book by Schopenhauer, which revived me beyond comprehension. My seeking mind suddenly stopped. All the struggles disappeared, and a clear understanding was revealed in a familiar way as if it were a memory. How many of you have read the German philosopher who lived in the 19th century, Arthur Schopenhauer? He had a profound effect on me as well when I was a philosophy minor at Vassar. 
Schopenhauer himself was influenced by Buddhism and Vedanta Hinduism. Moltoi was struck by the philosopher's insight that in the phenomenal world, it is impossible to attain true happiness, to find some final and eternal contentment that salvation from suffering can only result from the recognition that this individuality we speak of as ourselves is nothing more than an illusion. So here's a quote from his work, The World as Will and Representation. When willing disappears, both the willer and the world become nothing. The world of the willer, its hold over us, its seeming reality has been abolished so that it now stands before us as nothing but a bad dream from which we are thankfully awakened. Schopenhauer compared waking up to the emptiness of the physical world to the prajna paramita of Buddhism. We all chanted this morning, Heart Sutra. The Bodhisattva relies on prajna paramita with no hindrance in the mind, no hindrance. Therefore, no fear, far beyond upside down views, at last, nirvana. Wisdom, beyond any form, gone, gone, gone to the other shore. Gate, God. Paragate, parasangate, Bodhisattva. For Motoi, this Western philosopher's words were traces of the ox. He went on to Tokyo University where he organized a Zen sitting group for his fellow students. And he studied Japanese literature and continued practicing tea ceremony and wrote his thesis on the great haiku poet Basho's The Monkey's Raincoat. Probably everybody knows this haiku, but just in case you've forgotten, I will read it to you. First winter rain. Monkey too wishes for a small straw raincoat. He studied the Bible and the classics of Western literature. And he delved into the sutras. Jion Osho's preface to this second oxerting picture tells us, with the aid of the sutras, you gain understanding. Through study of the teachings, you find traces. 
even though the Zen school is based on special transmission outside the scriptures, not depending on words and letters, pointing directly to the heart-mind, seeing into one's nature and attaining Buddhahood. It is essential to fully absorb the words and teachings of the Buddha and ancestors. And in doing so, to realize them as our own. And every day we recite, however measurable Dharma teachings are, I vow to master them all. This is Zen practice. Yamara Mumon Roshi put it this way. The ancient teachers engaged in all branches of scholarship and studied all there was to study. But through scholarship alone, they were not able to settle what was bothering them. It was then that they turned to Zen. And that is why their Zen has real power and dynamism. And that is why we are here to do the same, to investigate thoroughly and to realize the wisdom is not anywhere but coming from our own hearts. To say so is one thing, to realize this is another. Intuitively, Moltoi really sensed the truth that the many vessels are all one metal and the 10,000 things are all yourself, as the preface continues. Sitting after sitting, he saw sameness in differentiation. In the Tenzo, we have pots and pans of various shapes and sizes, yet all are metal, one metal. And he experienced all phenomena, mountains, rivers, the good earth, as none other than himself. Traces of the ox already apparent. And he told his brother of his intention to, quote, go into the mountains and become enlightened. The preface goes on. If you do not discern correct from incorrect, how will you recognize true from false? Samadhi, no matter how wonderful, is not enough. You have yet to pass through that gate. Motoi knew Master Rinzai's teachings by heart. The true renouncer of home must gain genuine insight, the Master tells us. 
He must see through Buddha, see through the devil, see through the true, see through the false, see through the secular, see through the sacred. Only one who can discern in this way deserves to be called a true renouncer of home. A true renouncer of home. This monk's path beckoned. And soon after graduating from Tokyo University in 1930, Motui attended a Zen meeting where Katsume Keigaku Roshi, abbot of Kogakuji, gave a teisho. Afterward, he asked to be ordained. The ceremony took place on his birthday, March 19th, 1931, at Kogakuji, the temple founded by the great Basui Zenji in Enzan near Daibosatsu Mountain. So Enzan was 24 years old and he wrote a haiku expressing his monk's determination. Coolness. My heart reflected in water and sky. And I wanted also to read you haiku from following year, autumn. 1932, and he starts with a journal passage. Even with the slightest effort to crush and overcome delusion and laziness, an indescribably vast and magnificent world emerges at our feet. An ordinary person immediately becomes the master of the three worlds hero of the entire universe. But unfortunately, there are few who understand this. And the haiku, how solemn each patch of grass illumined by the moon. That same fall, he wrote in his journal, the famous Basui, founder of Kogakuji, where I was ordained, appears to me and scolds. You have engaged in worldly affairs, writing poems, and talking about secular matters. You are self-indulgent and are going against monastery regulations. In what place shall I chain you? I respond, Roshi, and he says, yes, I remain silent. He lets me go. And one more haiku from that same time. The journal entry precedes this haiku. Having entered the monastery, I now know my life is less than a dewdrop. drop. 
several of us visited Mount Daivasatsu and Kogakuji in 2007. Yes, Jikyo and Kushu, Jika, Myogen, quite a few of you on the Zoom screen too. The abbot Miyamoto Daiho Roshi told us that Monk Soen's four years there were at a time when the temple was so poor that there was barely any money for food or clothing. So he would go up the mountain and forage for his own food, and then there would be more to eat for the others. So Enzon never led a typical Unsui life, leaving for months at a time, going on pilgrimage, doing solitary retreats, becoming a student of the great haiku master, the Kotsu Ieda. His writings revealed traces and then full-blown encounters with the ox. On that trip, Miyamoto Roshi kindly arranged for our small group to climb Mount Dabasatsu. We were guided by friends of Edo Roshi, the Iwatas. When we reached Monk Soen's small hut, Sangai on three treasure hut, we lit incense, bowed, chanted, Namo Dai Bosa, secretly hoping to have a glimpse of Mount Fuji, which was right there. Hearing. Then we climbed further to a clearing near the top of the mountain. It was a magical view, but no Mount Fuji, although we could feel the great presence, right? And then what? Then the clouds rolled in, and suddenly we heard thunder, the unmistakable rumbling of Soen Roshi's voice. And just then, bizarrely, Hiromi Iwata got a call on her cell phone. In the heavens on Mount Daibusatsu. It was Miyamoto Roshi saying, You better go down right away. There's lightning danger, and rain will make the trail too hazardous to walk. And in my journal from that time, this is a journal with. Soen Roshi's haiku printed in the first page. All beings are nothing but flowers in a flowering universe. Anyway, I wrote, we began our descent. Rain was coming harder. It was more thunder. And at times, it would clear, it was like walking through moving cloud formations. And then, as the road grew more treacherous, muddier, more slippery, it was as though we were walking down a mountain stream. The rain got harder and turned to hail. Soon the entire ground was covered in large white marbles. 
We got wetter and wetter and colder. And the sleeve of my robe holding the umbrella was sopping wet. And mud was all over my kimono, the bottom of my karomo. And again, the mystical feeling of Soen Roshi's presence. Great difficulty. Great dedication. Unswervingly march on. And finally, after the last slippery slope of pure mud, we made it to the warm cars and to the Awata's lovely summer house, where we got served a wonderfully warm meal and tea. The elderly owner of the Ryokan, where we were staying, Unposo, at the foot of Mount Abesatsu, had built everything there himself. An outdoor onsen in a stone grotto, the huge flat rock suspended over two tall perpendicular flat rocks carved tree trunks providing shelter and the house itself the inn with its carved images in the flooring the chairs and benches made of ancient trees it was quite a remarkable place and he told us he remembered monk song he told us that as a young child, he and other villagers would watch their hands in gasho as the serious young monk took off for Mount Daibosatsu, which was around 12 miles away, walking barefoot to do solitary retreat on the mountain, where he lived the verse of this second Oxford picture. I will read it to you. By the water and under the trees, tracks in swift profusion. So and so on, sitting in his hut in the dense forest, mountain streams cascading, birds singing, traces were everywhere. In the sweet grasses thick with growth, they were revealing in the sutras, the teachings written on paper, heard in the music of the wind. Did you see it or not? The verse asks. For many of us, it's missed, M-I-S-S-E-D. We're intently looking, but seeking outside ourselves, we don't see it. Even when it's right under our noses, it's everywhere. For Monk Soen, it was already in his heart. Verse says, even in the depths of the deepest mountains, especially in the depths, how could it hide its snout turned 
toward the sky. That young monk, his eyes wide open as clouds parted. <sighs> Mount Fuji. Good afternoon, ox. Many deep experiences followed. While the Oxfording pictures paint a good progression of stages of practice from what beckons us early on in our lives to sitting, 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 some realization, perhaps actualization, Returning to ordinary, extraordinary mind. For Monk Soen, there were no stages. We heard last night Qigong Roshi say, left no trace. Seeking was finding. Traces, no. Full immersion in the fundamental realm, his natural home. He wrote in a journal entry on May 5th, 1933, At noon, the great white halo of the sun appears. I have heard that when our sincere wish is perceived by the heavens, a white rainbow pierces the moon. When I finish reciting the 600 volumes of the Avatamsaka Sutra on top of Mount Fuji, I witness such a white rainbow thrusting toward the sun above the vast ocean of clouds. Ecstatic with the solemn power of life, I have a vision. A Buddha image stands in a stone niche in front of me, his hands joined together. I understand it to be the embodiment of the great Bodhisattva of splendid affinity who brings all sentient beings to enlightenment. With great reverence, I invite the Bodhisattva to join and guide the painter Murashima and me on our pilgrimage to Mount Daibosatsu. And here is the haiku, splendid affinity, sun's great halo, green leaves. There is another journal entry where he speaks Um, through the meshing of various university experiences with periodic bouts of depression, I threw myself onto the path of monkhood. My soul gleamed at my having taken this great turning. One day I was wandering along the snow-covered path of Daibosatsu Pass. The sky was clear and the snow on the ground around me was a glittering halo. Waves of light shimmered and swirled. They splashed over me and boiled up around me. 
This vast brightness engulfed me and then subsided. Again it gushed up, overflowing, soaring and dancing. Then it narrowed to one concentrated, brilliant form, a white robe, Kanon Bodhisattva. I kept prostrating myself to this luminous image. The following year, the magazine Fujin Koron published haiku and essays by Monk Soen. And as most of you know well, in Los Angeles, a subscriber named Shubin Tanahashi showed it this issue to Nyogen Senzaku who was so moved by what he read that he wrote to the young monk, beginning a correspondence and a deep spiritual relationship. We continue to celebrate every 21st of the month with Mandala Day. In uh, his first letter to Nyogen Senzaki, Soen San wrote, In my mountain hut, where I pass the time leisurely, when I'm not reading the Avatamsaka Sutra, I read your joint translation. This is also addressed to Paul Reps of the Gateless Gate with great interest. I really appreciate your effort in conveying this great matter. I have also just finished reading your translation of an introduction to the 10 ox herding pictures. And I think it perfectly conveys the spirit of a transmission outside the scriptures. It has been said, it is not that there is no Zen in Japan, but that there is no Zen master. In the past, I was repeatedly disappointed in my search for a true teacher, but recently I vowed to practice to the death in the hall of Genpo Yamamoto Roshi. He had heard a Taisho by Genpo Roshi. He felt an instant connection. And of course, Genpo Roshi was abbot of Ryutakuji in Mishima, which is on the other side of Mount Fuji from Kovakuji. Even once he had gone to be Genpo Roshi's student at Ryutakuji, he often disappeared to do solitary practice in his hut on Mount Daivasatsu. Such a great vow he had, great determination, and he had to follow his own path. Genpo Roshi understood and treasured this seemingly wayward student. In May of 1938, he wrote, Looking for serenity, you have come to the monastery. Looking for serenity, I am leaving the monastery. Perhaps stop running about seeking the dusty affairs of the world. Fill the day, fill the night. 
and the next spring he wrote soft spring rain since when have i been called a monk He was always going further, marching on, never complacent. Even when he became abbot at Yutakaji, he continued going to strenuous sessions with Harada, Sogaku Roshi, at Hoshinji. There are many other wonderful moments of his life that I would love to tell you about if we had the time. And you can certainly, those of you who have not yet read Endless Vow and Namu Daibo Sa and Soen Roku, please do. And if you have, go back into them. It is such a treat to reunite with this great teacher just to go from one journal entry to Heiko and the next and the next. As you know, he was finally able to meet Yogen Senzaki after World War II. He arrived on Buddha's birthday, 1949, and gave his first talk at the Theosophical Society Library in San Francisco in June. And he quoted Faust and Master Basui's Master of Hearing. And he said, Because we can neither see nor catch this master of hearing, most of us think there is really no such thing. But because it is a fact that we are actually hearing this sound, there must be some master of hearing in our body or in our mind or somewhere. But we are unable to explain what this is. And so we begin to wonder, and then deep doubt begins. This doubt is very good for Zen work. Doubt and doubt, inquire and inquire, march and march to the unthinkable point. Ask, who is it who is hearing this sound? Ask and ask until you reach the bottom. All of a sudden, when the bottom is broken through, you will realize what the unexplained laws of nature really are. This Saturday, I will perform a no drama on this subject. This no drama will be my answer to the question who is the master who hears this sound. By that time, please give me your answer too. He loved, you know, theater so much, and several of us have been enjoying the workshops being given by Mayo Miwa Sensei in No Chanting. And we're encouraging her to do this on a regular basis. Son Roshi returned to Japan after his wonderful time with 
Yogin Senzaki in December of 1949. And we can feel another episode of depression setting in in this haiku. Vast emptiness as the year comes to a close, I re-enter the mountain. Then, September 1951, Sawa Nakagao is named Genpo Roshi's Dharma heir and abbot of Ryutakaji. He was 45 years old, and a less conventional Roshi could not have been found anywhere. The Rinzai Zen establishment was not his home. He loved visiting Yogan Senzaki in Los Angeles, and even after his dear friend's death, in 1958, made trips to take care of his belongings and his sangha. And I think maybe I can just read this beautiful passage after Senzaki's passing, he wrote him a letter. This morning, as usual, we woke up at 3.30 a.m. After morning service in the Dharma Hall, there were two dawn sittings. During the first sitting, I was in the zendo with the monks. Then the attendant monk hurried up to me and informed me of a telephone call from Los Angeles. At that very moment, as though struck by a bolt of lightning, my mind was joined by yours. The fourth person to come to Doksan was monk Edo Shimano, and his koan happened to be Tosotsu's Three Barriers. If you realize your true nature, you are free from life and death. When your eyes are closed, how can you be free from life and death? If you are free from life and death, you will know where you are going. When the four elements are disintegrated, where will you go? On this occasion, at this time, we thoroughly examined and clarified this particular koan, as I believe this is the best way to express our gratitude to you. There are so many, many memories, especially when he spent time with us at Daibosatsu Zendo in the Dirakuan Beach House. He would swim before dawn. He brought the great national treasure master of Shakuhachi, Warazumi Doso, who would play also before dawn, you would hear this mysterious sound echoing across the lake. And we would have session on the second floor in the zendo, and come down to do kinin in the Dharma Hall, and so on Roshi, would lead us in 
Namo Dai Bos are dancing. It seems like yesterday that we practiced with him. Yet I know many years have passed, and those who wrote memories at the end of the Soen Roku, Roku and in the postscript of Endless Vow, most are gone. Kangetsu Ruth McCandless, Chigetsu Ruth Lilienthal, Shugetsu Martha Kent, Kansetsu Norman Hogberg, Momondo Paul Rex, of course, Mio Own Maureen Stewart. They've all joined the majority, as Solomoshi put it. There are a few of us left. My first husband, Mitsunen Shoro Wu Nordstrom Roshi, Zenrin Robert Lewis Roshi, Sogon Larry Shainberg, Zenshin Richard Rudin, Eshin Brenda Lukwin. Shogetsu, Harry McCormick, Mick Sopko, Chief Baker, Chief Baker now at Green Gulch, and some others that some of you remember. But I want to just read from Son Roshi's last session at Daibosatsu in 1982, his last visit to America. Opening this Dharma, this Dharma incomparably profound and minutely subtle, Rarely met with, hardly met with. To get this chance is very difficult. To be born as a human being is very difficult. Among uncountable sperms and eggs, you were there. You are here. Wonderful chance. Congratulations. And even when we are born a human being and visit many churches, many monasteries, attend many, many sessions, to meet with true dharma is very difficult. This dharma, incomparably profound and minutely subtle, is hardly met with even in hundreds of thousands of millions of eons, we meet with this. Now we can see. Okay? We now can see each other. Listen. Now you are listening to my voice. Now we can see, listen, accept, and hold this incomparably profound, minutely subtle, hardly met with, even in hundreds of thousands of millions of eons, that we can all meet with this He's drinking.
made with one thing and one thing meat not meeting from the beginning we are nothing but this incomparably profound and minutely subtle dharma itself nothing but this nothing else but this please believe